Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for this week's edition of the Sabbath School Commentary. You're here with Pastor Matt Parra, and I'm the Sabbath School leader here in North New South Wales. You guys know that because you come and we hang out together every week. Not you and I, but you and a guest that we have here to present the Sabbath School lesson and share some insights from it. That's the point of this commentary. It's to help Sabbath School teachers and leaders in the local churches of our to as they prepare their Sabbath School class and and really also just members who want to get excited about the lesson. We don't share everything that this that the week's lesson shares, but we just highlight certain things that stuck out to us and also add some insight to the lesson. So well not add it, but just add insight to the membership. Anyways, um guys, yeah, thanks again. I want to have a word of prayer before we jump into this week's lesson. It's lesson number two in this series of lessons, and it's the fall. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thanks for the chance to be here and study together. Bless and guide, because we need you to, because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. And so give us the Holy Spirit, God, please, so we can have discernment and understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to begin this week's lesson in Sunday's portion. And we begin by studying Genesis chapter 3, verses 1. And two, and the title for today's lesson, for Sunday's lesson, is The Serpent. Now let's read together here Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more crafty, or some versions say subtle, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So we want to address briefly the identity of the serpent. Is the Bible teaching that a snake is talking to a woman? Oftentimes scoffers and skeptics, they make fun of the Bible and they talk about how It's just mythical stories from the Bronze Age where you have talking serpents and floating axe heads. And they put the most comical construct on the Bible to ridicule people who have faith that the Bible is the Word of God. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Bible is not teaching that an actual part of God's creation, uh, a snake that doesn't have the ability to speak, was speaking to a woman. What the Bible is is teaching us here is that a nefarious fallen spiritual being has inhabited the form or had, has inhabited the body or taken the form of a part of creation, a serpent, and is communicating to a woman through, through, through that medium, through that presentation of himself. It could be either way. It could be that the devil, the fallen angel Lucifer, is presenting himself as a serpent, or he could have taken physical control over the body and function of a serpent animal. Now, Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, describes a war that breaks out in heaven. And it's between Michael, one who's like God, and his angels, and the dragon, and his angels. The dragon, in the context of Revelation 12, is is primarily identified as Satan, the fallen angel who once stood in the presence of God as the light bringer or the light bearer on for, for God. So one of the angels who cover, one of the angels who stand by and, and see and observe the glory of God. And so Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9, there's a war that breaks out between Michael and his angels and the dragon and his, and the dragon and his angels don't prevail in the war. And the Bible says they're cast to the earth um, and there to reside. Now, in the context, just want to say something like a side note, guys. In the context of Revelation chapter 12, the casting out of Satan from heaven is a progressive casting out that spans millennia. When Satan created conflict in heaven itself, he's cast out in the sense that he loses his residence in heaven. He, He no longer resides in heaven but he still possesses access to heaven. We know this because in Job chapter 1, the Bible says in verse 6 that there was a day where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and the devil appeared among them or with them. And so this infers that the devil does not reside in heaven at this point in time, 
he resides elsewhere. He says to God that he goes to and fro on the earth. So he resides on the earth. So a part of the casting out of heaven, the casting out of Satan from heaven, it happened before the world was created. And he's cast out. He's cast to the earth with his angels. And this is where he resides since the very beginning. But he still has access to heaven in that scene. In Job chapter 1, he presents himself before the Lord. He's not there all the time. God says, where do you come from? And he says, I I come from the earth. That's where I rule. That's where I roam. And that's why I'm here as the earth's representative. And so there's a partial casting out that has happened already. And we see that by the time the book of Job is written or the time of Job, the man who the book was about. And then, but that, that casting out continues. Jesus describes in John 12 and John 16 that the prince of the world, who is the devil, is is going to be cast out at the crucifixion. And Revelation 12 communicates that as well. And so there is a partial casting out that happens before the world's created. And the devil loses his place in heaven. His residence is no longer in heaven. He's cast out. His residence is earth. And then the Bible says that um, at the crucifixion of the Son of God, he's cast out in, in in a second sense where he loses access to heaven. He, he, sorry, he loses access to heaven. And so there's a progressive casting out of Satan. So here we are. We want to take a look at this text, Genesis 3, verses 1 and 2. We notice together the craftiness of the serpent. He's very crafty. He's very subtle. He has a plan. He's concocted. He's constructed a plan to trap the woman. Think about the way that he approaches her. Has God not said or has God said? Depends on your translation. You can eat or you should eat from any tree. You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Hey, didn't God say that you can have anything here? You have free access to all of the trees of the garden? And the woman says, yeah, except for one. This is so crafty because he is subtly changing her focus or turning her focus from what she has to what she doesn't have. And so there's one prohibition for the human race. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the devil subtly points the woman's attention to that fact. Now, this is a common method of Satan. He wants to take from you all that you have. He wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. And and the way that he begins the process of doing that is he gets you to focus on what God has prohibited you from. And so it's interesting because what would, what were they prohibited from? One tree. What did they have access to? Every other tree. Perfect man, perfect woman, perfect health, perfect relationship with each other and with God. Everything is harmony. Everything is healthy. Everything is beautiful. There is no death. There is no anxiety. There is no stress. There is no depression. There is no disease. There is no loss. There is there's nothing. None of the suffering. None of the sources of suffering that we have to contend with here are there. She has so much. She has so much reason to be grateful. But here's the subtle, crafty serpent who's turning her attention from what she has to what she doesn't have. And if he can get her to fixate upon what she doesn't have and then to covet what she doesn't have, then she, he can get her, he can steal from her what she does. He can cause her to lose all that she has. This happens. So you have a wife, you have kids, you have a family, you have a house, you have a career. You have so much to be grateful for. You have so much to praise God for. And how does God begin the process of stealing all of that from you, taking all of that from you? He gets you to focus on the woman that God has forbidden you from having a relationship with. And if he can get you to covet what you don't have and and desire what you don't have, he can make you ungrateful for what you have. And he can steal from you and cause you to end up with nothing, to end up with absolutely nothing. And she says, the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we may eat. And then she's about to go on to describe that God has prohibited her from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We'll talk about that in tomorrow's lesson, in the next day's lesson. But just for now, just notice the subtlety of the serpent. He tries to get you to focus on what you don't have so that you can lose, so we can take from you what you do. So let's not, let's learn from that and and realize that we should be grateful for what we have and focus on what we have and what God has given us rather than focus on, focusing on what he has not given us. He withholds from us nothing but what's in our good to to refuse, or he holds nothing that's in our best interest from us. He he gives us all that's in our, that's going to benefit us. 
and we've got to, to remember that. Let's continue. Hey, we'll just jump on over to Monday's lesson. It's entitled The Forbidden Fruit. We're going to point out that in Genesis, the lesson points out that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, you have Adam in the garden receiving the command from God not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And also, we see that this is happening before Eve is, is, exists, before she was created. Notice, I'll just read the, the verses. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. So you have every tree at your disposal. You have access to all the trees in the garden, every single one. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Okay, eat and you'll die. Don't eat and you'll continue to live. So I am barring you from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I own this garden, Adam. It belongs to me. You are given dominion, but that's a gift. And I am the creator and I own all that is, and all that is comes from me and is for my purposes and is to live in accordance with my design. So I'm going to withhold one thing from you and me withholding that one thing from you, that will be a sign. It'll be a sign that, that I'm God, I'm the creator, and I gave you the garden. And in honoring that, you're honoring me and not touching that tree, you're honoring me and you're recognizing my sovereignty and you're acknowledging me as God. And further to this, I respect free will. I, the Lord, respect free will. I've created my creatures and I've with the power to choose. I've endowed them with a will and, and I respect that will. And being made in my image involves being able to choose, being a free moral being who can choose. And since I respect choice, I'm going to put a voting booth, as it were, in the Garden of Eden so that you can have a choice. We could say that Adam had a choice to sin or a choice to rebel, but really would he have if there was nothing to give him a choice. So the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, some people ask, well, why was it in the garden? It was like a voting booth. And this is the point of the tree. So now at this point in Genesis 2, when God gives the command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve does not exist. As I mentioned before, Adam is established as the moral governor of the garden before Eve is brought into existence. He's taken from the ground and he's given charge over the garden. And, and interestingly, he's physically equipped to contend with the natural world. And one is going to be brought into existence from his side, who's going to be more suited to nurturing life and caring for life because that physical being, his future wife, Eve, she's taken out of his side and given the uh, opportunity, the privilege to be mother, to deliver life into the world and to nurture that life inside of herself and to sustain that life when that life comes out of her, she's physically going to be equipped to be a nurturer and a carer and a relational and a guardian of relational integrity because she will be mother and he will be father and he will be protector, moral governor of the garden and she will be carer, nurturer, mother. Equals, yes, but not the same and serving differently in different roles and different capacities because they're biochemically different and biochemically different and better suited physically in a natural setting to perform certain duties and responsibilities. That is nothing that the lesson brings out, but I thought that's a point of interest and this is relevant to the ground that we're on theologically. More could be said about that, but let's move on in harmony with the lesson. Now we're reading Genesis 3, 1 through 6, and guys, this is like power, packed stuff. So we pick up in verse 3. This is Eve's response to the serpent. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. So she's recounting what God said to Adam. Now, we don't know if God had repeated this to Adam and Eve once Eve was brought into existence. We don't know from the text of the Bible. And we don't know if perhaps Adam communicated this to Eve. The two had become one. It stands to reason that that he may have communicated God's command to Eve, and that's fine. That would be fine either way, but we don't know from the Bible. Maybe Ellen White says something about it, and one of you guys are thinking, Ellen White says, yeah, okay. But from the text of Genesis, not so sure. Now the serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. 
And she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay, now just want to, where do we begin? Where do we jump in? Okay, God says, if you eat, you will die. I say, if you eat, you will not die. You will actually become more. You will ascend and rise higher. You'll not just be what you are today, a creature who is assigned more responsibilities and a purpose by God. No, you'll be as God yourself. So it's, it's really interesting here. You have this sense, this communication from the enemy, that the way to become more, the way to elevate yourself and your status is, is disobedience to God versus uh, the idea that, no, it's keeping yourself in a right relationship with God and positioned correctly in your relationship with God that allows you to flourish and prosper. All of human history attests to the truthfulness of God's word. Later in the story, when Adam and Eve are hiding from God, it's funny because God never said that in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, I'll kill you. He said, in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will die. And here they are in the garden later in the story, noticing that they're naked and they hear God's voice in the cool of the day and they don't want to be confronted by God. And so they, they run and hide. The fact that they ran and hide is, is confirmation of the words of God. In the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. They did die. Look at them. They're running away from the source of life. If you run away from the source of life, the consequence is death, right? So they're now disposed to be afraid of God and to run away from God, meaning that they're dead. They're spiritually dead. They were dead. And Ellen White says that as soon as Adam and Eve ate the fruit, they died on a spiritual level. And so the words of God, in the day that you will eat thereof, you shall surely die. They did die. Death is not just ceasing to exist. It's being outside of the will of God, outside of the law and life of God. If you place yourself outside of the laws of God, you are in essence choosing to die. It's You're, you're removing yourself from life support. You're jumping off the ship, as it were. You're jumping out of the plane. This is the effect of running from God. Is you're, you're, di- you're dead. You're dying. You can't live outside of God. God sustains your life. He brought you into existence. And the laws, he, he had, he has, he's created you in accordance with certain moral and physical laws. And to run away from God, to hide from God, to try to separate yourself from God is basically to kill yourself. And uh, so they now have the nat- a nature that the Bible describes as being dead. They have a dead spiritual nature and they're now alienated from God and being alienated from God is death. And so life and death are more than existing or not existing, being alive physically or not alive physically. Life is not just being conscious and breathing. Life is functioning in harmony with God's design, God's laws, God's life, because he's the source of life. I hope this kind of can make sense. Uh, to you guys. Okay, the woman saw, notice what it says. The, when the woman saw, so she's got two conflicting r- reports, one from God, one from the sat- from the serpent. If you eat, you'll die. That's what God says. But if you eat, you'll become God. That's what the serpent says. And then the text says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, how would she know that it was good for food? How would she know that? God says that in the day that you will, you eat of it, you'll die. But now she sees that it's good for food. Guys, If we use the intellectual capacity that God has given us, we can deduce from this that she saw the serpent eating it. (laughs) The serpent was eating the the fruit of the tree. And so therefore, oh, he's not dying. It must be good for food. And that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. Okay, how would she have seen that? Because an animal that did not possess the ability to speak was eating the fruit and speaking and telling her that she would uh, become a higher life form if she disobeyed God and ate this fruit too. So when she saw that, she took of the fruit and she ate, and she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. She chose to trust the demonstration of her senses over the evidence of God's word. This is important. Expects us to base our faith in him and our actions on the evidence of his word rather than the demonstration of our senses. So she was tricked by a miraculous demonstration, and this caused her to depart from the counsel of God and to abandon God 
and to betray him. A couple other just sentiments from this. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Some people interpret knowing good and evil as you've experienced good and now you'll experience evil. And I think that's a fair way, that's a fair interpretation of the passage. But there's something even trickier here with what Satan is saying. I want to submit to you that he's even, he's communicating something that's half true, half true. And this is what I mean. For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God knowing good and evil. Now, does God know evil in the sense that he's practiced it before at this point? No, not at all. But God knows evil in two ways, okay? Way number one is he defines what's good and he defines what's evil. So he knows, he comprehends good and evil. He defines what's good. He defines what's evil. The Bible says in Deuteronomy that he tells light from darkness and darkness from light. He calls evil, he he defines evil and good. And so you will be like God, he's saying, capable of judging for yourself what's good and evil. See, God is the judge of good and evil. He's the one who knows what's good and he knows what's evil. And the devil is saying to him, you don't need God to tell you what's good and what's evil. You don't need him to judge good and evil for you and then trust his word, trust his his commands. You don't need to do that. You can judge for yourself. And when, when you know, God is, when the Bible says uh, in verse 22, The Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. It's not saying that God has experienced evil because he's practiced it. It's simply saying that God knows what's good and God knows what's evil. He's a judge. He's the judge of good and evil. So when the Bible in in verse 22 here says, the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us. He's saying he's decided to judge for himself what's good and what's evil. So that's a half truth. So the devil was telling a half truth. You will be like God. You will be like God in the sense that you will take upon yourself the role of judging what's good and what's evil. So whenever a person takes upon themselves, as soon as a person believes that they are equipped or qualified to determine what's good and what's evil, they're basically becoming as God. They're making themselves a God. So he's in essence saying to Eve, make yourself a God. Decide for yourself what's good and evil. You can see that the tree is good for food. You can see it's desirable to make one wise. So God is holding you back from the fruit because he knows that if you eat it, you'll become just like him. That's a half truth. It's so tricky. It's so subtle. It's so crafty. He's playing with language. He's playing with the meaning of language and he's twisting it in such a crafty and clever way. He's telling her something that's true. They do become like God when they eat, but not that they're actually truly genuinely becoming divine but rather they're asserting themselves as if they're a God. And this is blasphemy. They blaspheme God in doing this. They're really, it's really an assault on the creator. There's another way that we can understand this. And I think it's, there's another way to apply this passage of scripture or to understand it, which I think is, it's there as well. I think it's, it's a good way to understand it. God knows the end from the beginning because he, he just has that ability to know the end from the beginning. Somehow, some way God can see through the corridors of time. And before the foundations of the world, he preordained or predetermined the plan of salvation so that if mankind would fall, then he would institute the plan of salvation. This was determined ahead of time. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about this. And Ellen White talks about it. She calls it the council of eternity. When the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit conspired together to salvage the loss of the human race to sin, if that were to arise. And he, he knew it. He saw it. He could understand it now. His comprehension, his comprehension is so keen, it's so precise that he can actually experience the future before it materializes, before it comes. I'm using language that's limited, of course, because I'm talking about things that are beyond us and our comprehension. It's on the verge here. But God can feel and experience the future somehow, some way. We don't fully comprehend. We fully don't understand. We just know that he knows the future. He knows the end from the beginning. And he knows good and he knows evil in the sense that he knows what's good and evil, point number one. And then point number two, he knows it in that he can comprehend the future so precisely that it's as if he's experienced it. He knows good and evil. These are two different ways to understand the passage. And I think both valid ways to interpret these texts about knowing good and evil. God is being indicted by Satan. You've heard this before, but he's being indicted as someone who withholds, not as someone who gives. He's not a giver, he's a withholder. And it goes back to the point of focusing her attention on what she's been denied. 
access to. He's not selfless, he's selfish. And this is, in, in, this is implied in what he says. In the day that you eat of it, you'll be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, wait, you'll be as God, you'll be like God? Now, if you say to someone, if you do this, you'll be like God, you're inferring that that's what you think God is like. Hey, if God were you, this is what he would do. So do this and you'll be like God. Now, what kind of an action is it to disobey God, the one who's given you everything, the one who loves you intimately and infinitely? That's selfish. Like you selfishly exalt, you know, you exalt yourself by disobeying God, disregarding his commands and disrespecting him as the sovereign creator who's given you all these things. It's supremely ungrateful to do this act of eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's steep. It's denying the sovereign right of, of God to put parameters in place. And, but just do it because you'll become more. Yay. You'll ascend above and you'll be just like God himself, that stingy old guy who's keeping you from happiness, from full complete happiness. And so Satan is inferring, he's insinuating, he's inferring and insinuating that God is a selfish person. And you should just be selfish too, because that's what God is like. He's all about exalting himself. And this is inferred in the text. Okay, so guys, Hiding Before God is the title of Tuesday's lesson. We only got another 30 minutes already. I'm sorry, man, I've been talking and expounding too much but we want to just make a few points here. Well, let's read this passage. It's really good. Verses 7 through 13. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Oh, okay, so they just found out that they were naked. The Bible says that they were created naked and they were not ashamed. And here it says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. Now Jesus says, or John says in the book of 1 John, it does not yet appear what we shall be, speaking of the second coming, but we know when he returns, we will be like him. Okay, we will be like him. So our bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 15, will be changed. There'll be different kinds of bodies at the second coming. This mortal will put on immortality. This corruptible will put on incorruption at the second coming. And the body is going to be transformed to a different kind of body. That's the whole argument of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, that which is planted in the ground, the seed which is planted is not that which comes up. You see the angels in that, that are at the grave site of Jesus when Jesus is resurrected. They're in white linen, fine and clean. And the armies in Revelation that return with Jesus are dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Linen, like literal linen, we don't know, but robes of white, shining, bright raiment of some sort. Further to this, the Bible says that the saints are clothed in the book of Revelation with fine linen. And Jesus says that in the resurrection, humans are like angels. They're as the angels. So you could say that the humans in the resurrection are dressed like angels. Now, I wonder, I wonder perhaps if before the fall, there was some kind of light or raiment or glow or shine to the human being that they lost in the transgression. Now, I think you could probably argue this from the text. It says the eyes of both of them were open. So you can see more once you sin? No. <laughs> After she took and ate from the fruit, and after Adam ate, their eyes were opened, not in, a sense that, not in the sense that they could see more and they were more illuminated to truth and light and wisdom, but rather they saw the consequence of sin and they lost something that they were once covered by and they knew it. They saw it. Wait a second. We're naked. We've been unclothed, right? Something has unclothed us. Sinning, un sinning made us naked. We didn't see that before. You wouldn't have seen it before not because they didn't have the capacity to look at themselves, but rather there was something covering them. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings, so they covered their private parts. Verse 8, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Remember? He's dead. He's spiritually dead. The Bible says to be carnally minded in Romans 8 and verse 6 is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind in verse 7 is at enmity with God and is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So if you're not subject to the law of God, you're going to be judged by that law, which is the law of life, and you will die. So here you go. Um, I was afraid and I hid myself. I hid. I ran away from the source of life and blessing and happiness and peace because I'm spiritually dead. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, interestingly, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Now, this is just fascinating. 
So she eats, then I eat. Now, Paul says very clearly in 1 Timothy 2 that the woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived, indicating, and there's many other biblical indications, that they were not actually together when Eve was sinning because she was deceived and he was not. If they were together, would he not have said, hey, this is not true? He wouldn't have, on some level, like interjected himself into the story and said, whoa, 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 we shouldn't do this. Elon, no, they weren't together. So he's, so, so he received, but he's together with her in the garden. So when it says that the woman gave to her husband who was with her and then they ate, it's not saying he was with her when she was interacting with the serpent, but he's with her in the garden and he with her ate. And there's so many, and there's an indication of 1 Timothy 2 where Paul says that she was deceived and he wasn't. That indicates they weren't together when she was interacting with the, with the devil. And then further to this, you, you've got in a second, God's going to ask Eve and, and it'll come out. I'll, I'll bring up a few more points about that in a second. But um, the man who receives this fruit from his wife and then chooses and realizes, ah, she's lost. And he, he decides that he can't live without her. And so he's going to just eat too. He's going to cast his lot with his woman, even though he knows that she's done the wrong thing and that she was tricked. She was tricked by the angel that they had been warned about. The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. So this is what sin does. It causes uh, relational separation. You were willing to die with her before. And now you're not even willing to take responsibility for yourself and what you've done. And you're throwing her under the bus. You're basically, you're casting her out, as it were, and saying it's all her fault. This is shameful behavior. He is forsaking his manhood. He's not taking responsibility. Like she was his gift from God. Like he predated her in existence a short period of time, yes, but he was made first, she was made second. He was as much her big brother as he was her husband. Like not in the familial sense, but yeah, like he's her elder brother, her elder human brother. And she's his gift from God. And he names her, her, she shall be called Isha because she came from Ish. This is what he says. And so guys, this gift from God who you were to protect and to provide for, uh, she, she falls into sin. You just join her in the rebellion. You follow her into the rebellion. And then, and even you saw that you saw what had transpired. You knew what was going on. And then you, in front of God say, it's the woman that you gave to be with me. So he's blaming the woman, and he's blaming God who gave him the woman, which is deplorable behavior. It's really shameful behavior. If if Adam wanted to fulfill his purpose, being made in the image of God and given the moral governorship over the Garden of Eden before Eve came into existence, he would have taken responsibility for what she did, and he would not have eaten with her. And when God came in the cool of the, of the day and, and was saying, hey, Adam, where are you? Hey, Eve, where are you? Adam would have said, we are here, and she has sinned but I'm responsible. Please take me instead. Now, this may seem like a wild idea to you guys, but it's not. It's so solidly in line with what the Bible teaches. Jesus is the second Adam, and he chooses to take responsibility for the fall that was not his fault. He's the second Adam. He he succeeds where Adam failed. And if Adam, you know, would have really been what he was supposed to be as a man, he would have not followed his wife into sin. But yet at the same time, he would have offered himself to die for her as the responsible agent. Let me die for her because I was set up as the moral governor of the garden before she ever even was brought into existence. I named her. She's a gift that you gave to me. You brought her out of me. She's the companion that was for me. I was not made for her. She was made for me to be in relationship with me so that I could love her. She was made for me to love her. And I failed in loving her and I failed in protecting her and I failed in providing for her. And therefore, and he wasn't to be faulted for her sin. She was responsible for her sin and for the choice that she made, just like you and I are responsible for the sins that we've committed. We're accountable. And then Jesus takes responsibility for our sins and he dies for our sins. And, and had Adam been a true man, I shouldn't say that because he was a true man, but if Adam would have fulfilled his manly responsibility, he would have chosen to die for his wife and never would have followed her into transgression. So you see his failings here. And then, then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? Okay. What is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent. So here, so Adam says, I got the fruit from the woman. God doesn't say you were lying. They're telling the truth. He's telling the truth. So the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me. He doesn't say the serpent gave us. He says, the woman gave me. And then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done to Eve? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So 
they, they weren't together at the time when Eve received the fruit from the devil. And then God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than any cattle and more than any beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. So much here, and I've been commenting as we've read through the passage. But look, I just want to highlight this. As soon as sin becomes the way of humanity, human beings are alienated, become alienated from God. And they become, there's a rupture in the relationship between God and humanity. And sin, it, it causes a rupture between Adam and Eve through human beings. So as Ty Gibson in his study guide, uh, the Truth Link study guide says uh, really well in this study on Genesis 3, he says that there was a relational fall. That is to say, human beings, th- their relationships fell, and then they became alienated from God. And and there was a perceptual fall where they perceived things differently. And that's why they were afraid of God. And this is all traceable to sin and what disobedience to God does to you and to your mind and to your heart. It has an effect, a physical effect on how you perceive, how you feel, what's going on around you. And the way to bring relationships together is the grace of God. Because where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. And so for human relationships to be restored, for people to come together who were previously separated because of the damage that sin has caused in their life. They need the grace of God, and they need to find repentance in God's name and restoration through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which they can experience in their own experience and live in their own lives. This is the answer to that problem. So sin alienates. Sin makes you, you know, throw people under the bus who you were just willing to die for. Now, some people think that Adam loved Eve so much that he was willing to give up his life for her. That's not what I see in the fall. And I don't think that's what God wants us to see in the fall. I don't think that's what's happening. I think what's happening is he made her an idol. He loved the creature or the creation more than he loved the creator. And so he decided to die, not for her, but he decided to die with her. And so life would not be worth living if he could not have her, meaning he had deified her. Okay, now, When you deify another human person, you're not really loving them. You're worshiping them. And no person, no creature is worthy of worship. They can't sustain the pressure of expectation that comes with you worshiping them. And they may like it for a while, but eventually it becomes too taxing, too burdensome, and it crushes them. The weight of that pressure of being a god to someone. And so he doesn't realize, for some reason he chooses not to, he he doesn't remember that, that she's a gift from God. And that all of the happiness and joy that their relationship has produced is a gift. And she, and abandoning God for the sake of the gift who is chosen of her own free will to, to go her own way. Like that, that is not, that's not a good thing. That's a, tr- that's a terrible sin. Did he not trust God enough to believe that God would provide a measure of some atonement for her? And did it not ever dawn on him that maybe he could intercede on her behalf? and that he didn't have to follow her into transgression. He could have trusted to the grace and mercy of the God who had given them all of what they had. And so to truly love her, to truly love her, he wouldn't have followed her into sin. He would have led her to righteousness, right? Or called her to confession and repentance in God's name. And then if need be, die for her. Now notice what Ephesians 5 says, Paul speaking to husbands. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So love your wives, not as Adam loved Eve and made a God out of her and followed her into transgression. No, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Call her to a higher standard, to to repentance in God's name, to following in the footsteps of the Lord of glory and, and lead her to heaven. And if need be, you die for her and you take responsibility for your home and for your family. And that's what we're called to as men in our homes. And uh, women's honor your husbands as if you're honoring the Lord, not that your husband is the Lord, as if you ha- he has some arbitrary right over your life where you can't think for yourself and do for yourself and choose the life you want to live. Your husband doesn't have authority to tell you how to cut your hair or what you must do for a career. That's not the authority that God is giving husbands in their home. He's giving them authority to be the Jesus of their home. And so every home is given a personal attendant who is there to to live the life of Jesus as an example and to take responsibility as Jesus did and to sacrifice for the sake of the family, to provide for and to protect 
as Jesus did the church and as Jesus does the human race. And as a man does that, a woman is called to follow him. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, is what Paul So it's not saying you have to unconditionally submit to a man because he's a man. It's saying, I'm calling all husbands to be like Jesus. And women, as your husband's like Jesus, you follow him. And, he, and so it's like a reversal of the fall. So Adam follows Eve into sin, and then the human race, the church, the, the saved of the human race follow Jesus out of sin. And husbands, love your wives like this. Do like this. Be like this in your home. Not as Adam loved his wife, but love as Christ loved the church. So he failed in his love to his wife because he made her a God. And he just surrendered to her as if she was God. And he followed her. And so God says, no, don't do that. Don't be that irresponsible man who just like, gives himself up to the whims of his wife. No, husbands, love your wives, yes, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he may sanctify and cleanse her by the washing of water through the word. So a man has committed the responsibility of being a minister to his family and for his family to protect spiritually and to provide spiritually and to physically protect as well as Jesus eventually will. Now, so much more that could be said, guys, but we're out of time. How do you do it? This is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Wednesday's lesson, the fate of the serpent is predicted in Genesis 3.15, and it's the first gospel promise in all of the Bible that enmity will be placed in the heart of humanity for the serpent, and the serpent, his head will be crushed. So the seed of Jesus and the seed of the serpent are going to be at enmity, and the serpent's going to be crushed. So God is going to come into the human race in the person of Jesus and to succeed. he's going to succeed where we failed and he's going to offer himself as an atonement for our sins and he's going to be resurrected as, as the new representative head of the human race and he will represent the human race before heaven and give the spirit of God to humanity to be restored and to, yeah, to be restored. And uh, there's so much that can be talked about here, but I just want to uh, say that something that astounds me about God is how he's very emo God is all the emotions that we feel and experience are part of being made in the image of God. God feels. Now I've learned as I've gotten older and wiser and as my mind has developed, I, I have, I learned, I have, I feel more deeply than I think I did when I was young. Now young, I'm not saying that young people don't feel deeply, but the, the, you, you have, as you grow more capacity to feel because you have more capacity to understand. And comprehend. And so your feelings expand along with your intellect. And so God being infinitely wise and knowledgeable, like infinitely intelligent, like he has a super intellect that is, he's infinitely wise. We can't even begin to approach like the wisdom of God, like his wisdom is foolishness. To our, our wisdom is foolishness to him. But anyways, I'd like to be able to share words that would help you understand how intelligent God is, but I'm just trying to say God's really smart. And so along with that intelligence comes depth of emotion, right? So as emotional as God must be, he must feel pains much more acutely than we do. Insults much more acutely than we do. Offenses much more acutely than we do. So being injured, being stolen from, being abandoned, being betrayed will hurt someone to the degree that they can comprehend what's happening and grasp what's really transpiring. So God with his super intellect is going to feel pain much more deeply than we shallow-minded humans. We depraved and fallen humans, but yet we can feel pain very acutely, very profoundly. And we can, when you're betrayed, when someone cheats on you and lies about you, when a friend betrays your trust, like that's so humiliating. It's so hurtful. It, it makes you feel assaulted, polluted, terrible, right? Like you guys know what I'm talking about. And so how much more does God feel that right in the, right, right here? So he's given humanity what he's given them because he loves them. And he's shown nothing but unselfish love to them. And how do they repay him? One gets deceived by the serpent. I want to be as God. And somebody could say, well, she's just a victim because she was deceived. I don't buy that. If she was just a victim, then who's responsible for her sinning? God, whose fault is it that she sinned? It's God's. I don't like when people say she was just a victim. She's not a villain. Like, I think that she, yeah, is a victim, but she's also a villain. Because she's doing something horrible that's not excusable. There's no excuse for what she did just because she was deceived. She didn't have to be. If you, She had every opportunity to be faithful to God and to trust the promise of God and to trust the word of God and to, to heed God's warning. And by the way, it's inferred in the text of Genesis 3 that Adam and Eve were warned about the serpent. Why would the devil come in the form of a snake 
unless Adam and Eve were warned about an angelic rebellion. Why not come to them in the form of an angel? Hey, God has told me he changed his mind. You can have this fruit now. That's an easy thing to do unless they were already warned about a fallen angel and a rebellion that happened in heaven or that was in the process of happening. You follow? So she had every opportunity to say, hey, this is it. No, no. She has a conscience. The Holy Spirit's at work with her. She was not in any way, shape, or form built to disobey God. She was built in harmony with the love and law of God. And so she was a victim because she was deceived, but she was also a villain. She also was. And and what she did was it was inexcusable. So the woman who represents half of humanity, she's deceived. She chooses to believe a lie. And the man isn't deceived, but he chooses to worship the woman who believes a lie, who chose to believe a lie rather than be like Jesus and take responsibility and offer himself as to die on her behalf. I think that would have been the noble thing to do. That would have been the manly thing to do. That would have been the godly thing to do. That would have been the thing that you do when you're acting in harmony with the divine nature that you were created to uh, live out. So anyways, so here, how deeply does this hurt? How painful is this experience for him? It's probably extraordinarily painful. Uh, But but how does he respond in the scenario? Yes, he pronounces curses on the serpent. He pronounces a curse on the land, but then, and, and he actually institutes some painful remedial processes that human beings have to go through, some consequences that are quite pain in childbirth, pain in bringing forth food from the world. This is what God says. He looks at you men who were designed to contend with the natural world. The natural world is going to contend with you in a lot harsher ways now. So in order to bring forth food from the ground, men, it's going to be really difficult, really tough. This whole process of nurturing life in yourself and delivering it into the world, it's going to become gnarly and painful and terrible. Now, this isn't a curse that he's pronouncing. This is just consequences of your actions that will serve to develop your character and make you better people and help you learn faith and confidence and trust. The trial will perfect you. It will refine you. And without it, you'd become absolutely horrible. So it's consequences of mercy. And and then this happens, of course. But here's the last point, guys is that that then the gospel promise comes. Then the gospel promise comes. This is what I'm going to do, Satan. You haven't gotten the best of of me, and you haven't won in the great controversy between good and evil. You haven't, because I will put enmity between them and you, and your seed and their seed. My seed, you're going to bite his heel. You're going to hurt him, but he's going to crush your head. He's going to destroy you and defeat you. So Jesus will come into the world and defeat Satan on his own ground, and he will crush the head of Satan. He will prove that humanity can be faithful and the law of God can be kept. And through his victory, we all attain victory and become new creatures in Christ. But it's okay. So I said to you guys, you might be thinking, okay, how does this all tie together? Here's guys how it ties together. The response of God is amazing to me. So as deeply as he feels the hurt, as profoundly as he feels because of his super intellect, he responds in gracious kindness by promising responds to the betrayal by graciously promising to fix what's been messed up, to intercede on behalf of the race that's just betrayed him. This is astounding to me. This shows the most unbelievably self-possessed God and the most unbelievably unselfish person. God is a very unselfish person. He's a very merciful being. He's a very gracious person. He's very humble to be humiliated by his own creation. To be really, ultimately, this is mo- this, he, they were making mockery of the infinite, unintentionally so, perhaps, but still, they became the sport of Satan, and they embarrassed God in front of the universe. And what's his response? I'll take care of it. That's all right, guys. I'll fix things. Like I'll work it out. I'll fix it. I'll fix it. So this is a great God. This is a good God, and this is a God who is presented in the Bible. Praise Him. I thank Him because uh, of His gospel promise and the work that He has accomplished on our behalf. Uh, he's fixed it. He's made it right. And so, guys, God bless you. I hope that this commentary has been of some use to you. It's been 58 minutes. We've just gone twice as long as I um, usually go. But, uh, but hey, sometimes it's good to hang out for longer periods of time. I hope, uh, God bless you guys. Have a great week. And I'd just like to mild appeal and say uh, let's all renew our hearts in God now and, and tell him that we trust ourselves to his salvation and that we thank him for putting enmity in our hearts for evil and for selfishness and for Satan and for sin. And let's commit and purpose to walk the walk of Jesus. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 6, He that says he abides in him ought also himself walk even 
as he walked. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.